All right, here we are in Exodus chapter 34, having ourselves a good little time. This is lesson 10 that we've done, so we are heading down the home stretch. And so go ahead and turn in your Bible. Ezekiel 34 is where we will be. Now, this is uh, perhaps the most famous part of the book of Ezekiel. You've got this, you've got 37 uh, with the Valley of Dry Bones, which is just a load of fun as well. Then you've got Ezekiel 18, uh, the soul who sins, that soul shall die. Ezekiel 18, 20, that you'll hear preachers uh, bring up whenever we are tagging on Calvinism. But the uh, shepherd passage is perhaps the most famous. And anytime you hear preachers working on John 10, they run back here for just a little bit because it's juxtaposed and it works really well on John 10. Now, the most famous job I think that you'll find in Scripture is that of a shepherd. Everybody's a shepherd. That's kind of the family business uh, as you go through and as you think about it. You see uh, where in the very beginning you had Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain appeared to be a she or no, Cain appeared to be a farmer. Abel appeared to be a shepherd. And so you see that he uh, had his flock, then his sacrifice. And you see many of Abel's children, or Seth's children, excuse me, will be shepherds. And we'll get down to Genesis chapter 12, and you see that he is a shepherd. Abraham is a shepherd there. In Genesis 13, Abraham is such a good shepherd. He and Lot uh, begin having trouble because Lot has a lot of sheep. And so they're going back and forth. Uh, you'll go down to uh, Genesis chapter 30, and there you read about Jacob and Laban, and you see Jacob's unique breeding program. Remember, you lay the uh, twigs a certain way in the water, and the goats come out with spots. We're still not exactly sure what all was going on there, but you see from there that Jacob's a shepherd. You uh, go all the way to the book of Exodus. Moses grew up first 40 years in Egypt. And his second 40 years, he worked for his dad, Jethro, and uh, he was a shepherd <coughs> out in the wilderness, uh, learning the lay of the land before he'd lead the children of Israel the last third of his life. Uh, you look at David, and in 1 Samuel 16, you see that he is a shepherd. As a matter of fact, he's out keeping the sheep when Samuel comes to anoint a king, and they go through all of David's brothers, and finally they say, we've got to bring David in. And you know about shepherds because Psalm 23, right? You know about shepherds from Luke 15, uh, the parable of the lost sheep. You know about shepherds from John 10. You know about shepherds because that's the term, one of the terms used for elders. You see an elder, you see a, um, an overseer or presbyter, or if we'd put in our language, a manager, a store manager. That's really the word being used there. And then you see the word poimain, which is a shepherd. And so you see those terms used in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, and also 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And so when God is trying to describe the way his church and the way his people work, he loves the term or the name shepherd. And so that brings us to what we're talking about as we go into this passage. So let's start in chapter 34, and let's begin reading in verse 1. And we'll go through verse 9-ish, 10-ish, somewhere along in that range. This is New King James I'm reading from. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled over them. So, when they, so they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered all through the mountains, and on every high hill, yes, my flock was scattered all over the face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock. 
But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, and they shall no longer be food for them. All right, so what you see is Ezekiel is talking about the leaders of Israel, and he says they are the same thing as absolutely worthless shepherds. They are working in a selfish and a wrong-handed way. Now, remembering that, we'll get off of our notes here just for a little bit. Turn over to John chapter 10. And hopefully you've noticed over these 10 weeks that we've studied John's favorite book in the Bible. His favorite book is going to be the book of Ezekiel. And as you go through the book of John, what you see is a ton, a ton of, reputation, of repetition of what's in the Ezekiel. Now, we never notice that because we don't study Ezekiel very much. But John loves this book. And um, you see it throughout his gospel. You see it throughout 1 John. And you see it throughout the book of Revelation. And so it's a pretty common thing, which is here. All right. So now here we are in John 10. And we could go a lot further because John 10 is really a retelling of Ezekiel 34 and a fulfillment of prophecy. But we'll get there uh, later. John 10, let's look in verse 7. Jesus says, And most of your last say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. Okay, now skip down to verse 12, or we'll look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep, and he scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling. He does not care about the sheep. All right, so John expands Ezekiel 34, and he says there's two kind of bad shepherds. The first one is a thief. Now, why do you have people who steal cattle or sheep or whatever else? They're looking for money, right? Looking for an easy way to make a buck. Uh, you don't have to be there through the birthing process. You don't have to spend all your time feeding them, building fencing for them or whatever else. It's time to slaughter them. So you sneak across the fence and you grab a couple of sheep. And then you have them, you take them to the slaughter, and you make a whole lot of money. Now, why do people do sheep stealing today? Of course, Satan is the ultimate sheep stealer. But you have some people who are always looking to raise up disciples after themselves, and they're taking people away from Jesus and causing them to follow themselves. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, as uh, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders, he says, there will be some who will rise up, even among yourself, who are going to draw disciples after themselves. There is a temptation in the church of a desire to gather power. And some of the most political people you'll ever find can be church people. Uh, hopefully, you've never lived through a church split. I know some people have. When you go through a church split, um, you go back and forth, and it's a sad thing because you end up treating brethren worse than you would pagans, right? I, I was a part of a church split, I think, when I was in late middle school, maybe early high school. Um, some people had preacheritis, and some people really did not have preacheritis for that preacher. And so, you know, the preacher went off, started his own congregation across town and all that business, and... Um, you know, we could eat with denominational people in a restaurant. We could hang out with pagans in a restaurant. But, man, somebody from that bad church walks in. Oh, it got uncomfortable all of a sudden, right? It's just super political, which is there. And those two politics, those two political groups, are trying to get everybody on their side and stealing back and forth. And what you'll see when a split happens, especially if it's not attended to in a healthy way, is the focus no longer is on Jesus. The focus is on what the people across town are doing. And the people across town, all they're going to do is 
in their sermons talk about whatever this church over here is doing wrong. And when the church gets caught up in that business, the church shrinks. Because nobody's drawn to that. It just makes us feel better. Nobody's drawn to that. You need to preach on Jesus. You need to preach on how to live as Jesus' disciple. And you need to put him first. And so Jesus here talks about these thieves, people who are coming in and trying to gain power and disciples after themselves. Now, sometimes preachers have huge egos. Uh, Usually that's something more common than not. Preachers are pretty egotistical. And so there's a joy, a a perverse selfishness that comes from trying to have the best sermon in town or trying to have the largest congregation in town or trying to be the best at this or that or whatever else. And people are drawing disciples to themselves instead of Jesus. Don't be the thief because that is a bad shepherd. Now, what's this next one that he talks about here in John 10? He talks about looking here in verse 12, the hireling. All right. Why does a hireling not care about the sheep? They're not his. <laughs> he works 8 to 5. And as soon as 5 o'clock comes and he hears the ding, it's not my job anymore, right? Just got to get them through. It's not my job. I'm either too important of that to do that or I'm not important enough to do that. It is not my responsibility. And so what you have is people who are coming through doing the bare minimum, doing as little as possible, but still getting paid. And when you have shepherds, when you have sheep that way, when you have people in your church who are doing as little as possible, just enough so they're not getting in trouble, the church runs into trouble. The church runs into difficulties right there, doesn't it? And so what's happened, going back over here to Ezekiel, and go ahead and turn back to Ezekiel 34, is these leaders of Israel have been caught up with politics, have been caught up with, this is not my responsibility, not what I need to worry about. They've been caught up with everything that's going on all around. And because of that, they are not living the way that they should. Now, getting to context, what is it Ezekiel's talking about? The northern kingdom of Israel had... Depending on how you divide it up, I think either 19 kings or 23 kings, depending on how you divide it up. How many kings were righteous in the northern kingdom? None of them. Every one of them did not search for God, but went off in their own way. Jeroboam, the northern king, said, hey, this is not good. All my people are going to want to go to Jerusalem to the south to worship, and I can't have them leaving the country So he said, hey, I'm going to put in our own gods. We're going to have our own religion. We're going to have our own worship. Eventually, some of that turned into the Samaritan religion. Uh, That would come as a hybrid later. But they're all self-seeking. Instead of bringing the people closer to God, they're seeking self. Now you begin looking at the southern kings. And out of all the southern kings that you have, you only have about six that are righteous. Saul, was he righteous? No, lost God's spirit because he didn't know how to handle conflict and it all had to be about him, okay? <clears throat> you got David. In Acts 7, we read that David is a man after God's own heart. Uh, if I ever write a book on marriage, I'm going to focus it on David because David did everything wrong. The way he raised his kids, the way he treated Michael, the way he treated Bathsheba, the way that he handled conflict within his family. In your family, do the everything opposite of David, and you'll work out pretty well. He had every part of his life good, David did, except his family. And that's what brought him down. You got Solomon. Solomon, 900 concubines. This next Sunday would be rough on him, wouldn't it? Mother's Day. You know, think of all those wives and all those concubines. Can you imagine trying to get all their names straight? Right? This last week, I went to a a birthday party uh, for uh, grandkids. Uh, Rhonda's oldest boy, Alex, has six grandkids, has one on the way. So it's going to be the lucky seven. And so, I, you know, I know their names. If you give me a little bit to stare at them. 
But the whole birthday party, it was, hey, you, you know, because there's a bunch of them. Well, that's what Solomon's doing with all of his wives. And, of course, he has to go through and show honor to each one of these wives. He has to follow their gods because these are all political, political things which are going on, things which he has to do. And so he ends up losing his relationship because family becomes more important than God. Then you got Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and you just go down. You see how they're all evil shepherds. They let other things get in the way of leadership, which is there. Now, going back the other direction, priests. Aaron was chosen to be the high priest. If you go through and you look at his four sons, Nadab and Abihu and Leviticus 10, they're put to death. And you begin going through the high priest, whether it be Eli, the one right before Samuel, evil man, because he would not watch his children, would not discipline his kids. If you go down all the way to um, Annas all in, in Caiaphas, the high priest in the days of Jesus, they were all self-seeking. That has been the case of people who follow God from the beginning of time. And we've got to be sure that it's not our case. God does not want evil shepherds. So what is the definition of a good shepherd? Somebody who feeds a flock, somebody who cares for the flock, and somebody who, when the flock is lost, they go out and they find them and they bring them back. Somebody who, when the, somebody in the flock is broken, they go and heal them and bring them back. Now, let me tell you something. It is a lot more fun as a church leader to create programs, to create uh, videos, to create sermons, to create whatever it might be. Those things are fun to do. But what's necessary for leaders is to do things which aren't always the most fun. Broken people can be tough to be around. They're hard to fix because there's a lot of healing which is there. But the good shepherd goes and they heal folks. All right? People who have wandered from the flock, that's hard to bring them back. Invariably, I smile every time that one of our kids preaches on Luke 15, uh, whenever they hop up here. Because every time, now you can smile when they say it too, they always say, you know what, sheep are dumb. They always say it because, you know, sheep will fall into the water. They'll walk off a cliff. They'll, um, you know, say, hey, there's a coyote. Let's go talk to the coyote, you know. And they'll say, sheep are dumb. Okay. Sheep are not dumb. Sheep are sheep. You know, chickens act a certain way. Cows act a certain way, right? Uh, Northerners, Southerners act a certain way. Sheep act a certain way, and that's just what sheep do. They're designed where you have to have somebody who cares for them. Many times, the sheep of God's flock will wander off. Sometimes they're attracted by something sparkly. Sometimes they're caught up in their world, and they don't see what's going on around them. They look up, and they're all by themselves. Sometimes they're confused. Sometimes they don't trust the shepherd. But it's a responsibility of shepherds of God's people to search those people out and bring them back. Those sort of things are unpopular to do. Those sort of things are uncomfortable to do. Those sort of things are hard to do, but we're called to do it. We're called to do it. I like a fella. I read a lot of his books. He does um, a certain kind of farming. His name is Joe Salatin. And Maybe you've heard of him, watched some of his YouTube videos, or maybe uh, have read some of his books. I've read just about all of his books. What's your name again? Joe Salatin, S-A-L-A-T-I-N, um, progressive farmer. Uh, he, well, he, he's not worth introducing for this class, but I was introducing him just to say for a quote, your animals, when you raise them, should have only one bad day. And, of course, that's the day that you take them to the slaughterhouse. You know. And he said, your goal as a good farmer, as a good keeper of flocks, is to make sure your animals are absolutely happy at least until that last day. And he says, and if you can, make them happy on that last day, but they're going to figure it out on the way. But, you know, as long as you can, keep them happy. 
Well, that, that should be the way that shepherds work with the sheep. You know, make them, you know, make it where they appreciate what they have, where they are, and the things which they're doing. Help all those things to go along, and that will work. Sadly, too many people are in the business of church to make themselves famous, to make themselves more important, to look after their own needs. They don't see how difficult it can be to look after the needs of other people. That's something important. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Hebrews 13, 7 says, you know, obey those who rule over you in the church, seeing that the direction they went went well. Hebrews 13, 17 says, you know, make the job of an elder, make the job of a church leader, that's the way he puts it in Hebrews, to be a good job because his job is to watch over your soul. In other words, make it as easy as possible for them. Okay, so God is angry. And he's speaking his anger through Ezekiel because his shepherds aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So get to verse 11. We get to verse 11. God says, I am taking over. Okay? Read with me, if you will, 11. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for all my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on a day he is among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and the valley and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and in their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what is lost. I will bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. I will... But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. As for you, my flock, says the Lord, behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture, and to have drunk the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet. They drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with the side and shoulder, butted with all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. All right? That brought us to verse 22. God's coming in. And when God comes in, he is going to undo the work of these evil judges, of these evil shepherds. They let the uh, sheep go. They lost them. You look at the northern nation of Israel, they were scattered all the way up to Greece, all the way up to modern-day Turkey, all the way down to Egypt. The Assyrians sent them everywhere. The idea of the Assyrians, capital city of Nineveh, was the way that you keep people from rebelling against you is you move them out of their hometown. And the way you keep them from rebelling against you is you put them in small groups and stick them somewhere where the agriculture is different, where the language is different, and where the weather is different. And by doing that, they'll be homesick, they'll not be able to get together, they'll be brokenhearted, and they're just stuck. And so the northern nation was scattered everywhere. The southern nation was taken into captivity to Babylon. Some escaped and went to Egypt, but they're over here. God says, look at what my evil shepherds have done to my nation. They've scattered them everywhere. I'm going to bring every one of them back. I'm going to give them opportunity to be back and to be here. Look at all the people who are hurt. I'm going to give them peace. I'm going to rebuild their temple. I'm going to give them a good place to be. Look at all the people who are uh, hungry. I'm going to give them food. I'm going to give them a place where they can rest and where they can know that God is in charge. Then we see interesting stuff. And you may have caught it, may not have. There in verse 17. He's going to judge between sheep and sheep. What you'll notice here is this case. All right? Hurt people hurt people. Okay? Let me say that again because that was weird sounding. Hurt people hurt people. Stereotypically. It doesn't have to be this way, and it won't be this way in your life. But a person who grows up in an abusive home 
learns from their father and mother what it means to be a husband and a wife and a mother and a father. And so they search out and create a home that's just like the home they grew up in. A person who endures abuse oftentimes will be abusive to others because they've understood that that's normal. That's regular. And you put them in a situation where there's love, where there's acceptance, and when there's forgiveness, and it's almost chaos because it's so different than their language that they've learned, than what they know. God knows when he takes care of these shepherds and puts them out of the way and he brings these flocks back that these hurt people are going to hurt people. And so he's talking about the fat rams and the skinny sheep. You ever notice, especially if you've ever raised chickens or if you've raised any animal, cows or anything, oftentimes you'll have a dominant bird or a dominant animal and that animal will turn out to be a bully to all the others. And there'll be a bully until there's a bigger bully somewhere else. God says, I'm not going to allow that to happen in the church. I'm not going to allow that to happen among my people. I'm going to regulate it and make everybody equal in God's sight. He recognizes that hurt people hurt people, but he's going to make it where he is going to judge between us and make it where the church is a place where people are accepted. The church is a place where everybody is important. The church is a place where everybody matters. And that's the kind of congregation that we have got to always work on creating. This world is too lonely of a place for us not to be that kind of church. And this world is too mean of a place for us not to be that way. We've got to love one another. We've got to forgive one another. We've got to be there for one another. That is what we are called to do. And so that's absolutely the way that we need to live, and that's absolutely the way we need to act as we're together to do these sort of things that you see here. Now the fun part. Uh, We've just got through the simple part of the chapter. Now we'll look at some stuff. Look at verse 23, (coughs) and let's guess who we're talking about. I will establish one shepherd over them, He shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Oh boy, here we are, David. Now, David's been dead for a couple of hundred years. So, you know, it it would kind of be a bummer to dig him up and put him out there. So who is Ezekiel talking about? Jesus. Great. Turn over to Acts 2. And when we hit Acts 2, you know... And we're in the Lord's church, so we're going to Acts 2.38. This time we're not. I want us to look at some other stuff in Acts 2. Okay. We've just seen verse 22, Jesus, the men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man who is attested or proven to be the Son of God by his miracles, wonders, and signs. You know him. Okay. Now, Check out verse 25. 25, David, this is the real David here, writes, I foresaw the Lord God always before my face. He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced. My tongue was glad. My flesh will also rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In other words, you're not going to let me die and you're not going to let my body rot. You have made known to me the ways of my life and make me full of joy in your presence. All right, look at verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. Let me be a little bit, he's saying, uh, gross here real quick. David, he says, David is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He's standing on the portico of the temple, and he's pointing to the tomb. The tomb's not there anymore. It kind of got lost in the Crusades, but he's pointing. And he says, there is David's tomb. And guess what? David is dead, and David's body's corrupted. It's rotted away. So David, even though he said, the Lord's not going to leave me dead, the Lord's not going to let my body rot, Peter says, there he is, and he is dead. So, therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn an oath to him, that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing, spoke this concerning the resurrection of the Christ. 
that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, which we are all witnesses. Therefore, he's exalted at the right hand of God, having received the Father from the promise, the Holy Spirit. He poured out this, which you now see. So David did not ascend to the heavens. So see that there in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ means Messiah or anointed one. Lord means king. And so Peter, in the very first gospel sermon, quotes David just like Ezekiel did. And he says, this David is Jesus. He is the son of Jesus, and it's a promise through whom it's come. And so the shepherd that we see here, this shepherd David, is going to be Jesus. All right? Which brings us to John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. See the circle here? Jesus is pulling things out of the Old Testament, and he's saying, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the king, I'm the one who's resurrected. And you see all those things there. So, what does it mean that Jesus is king? Verse 25, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. What's that covenant? Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, or Hebrews 8. What's that covenant? I will make a new covenant. What is it? It's a New Testament. Matthew through the book of Revelation. We're no longer under the Mosaic covenant. We are now under the covenant of grace, of law, and of truth. And that's the covenant of Jesus. Okay? Now, I'll keep cause the wild beasts to cease from the land. We're still working on the uh, shepherd motive here. And they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I'll make them sleep. I will make them in the places all around. Now, verse 25, where it says sleep in the woods. Don't follow that example. Don't sleep in church. Verse 26, I will make them in the places all around my hill of blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. And there will be showers of blessing. That'd make a good church song, wouldn't it? Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. The earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land. And they'll know that I'm the Lord when I've broken the bonds of their yoke or the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the land of those who have enslaved them. They'll no longer be prey to the nations, but I will bring them home. Beautiful passage. What is he talking about? Where is this covenant of peace where God will restore his people and give them a beautiful place. It's the church. It is absolutely 100% the Lord's church. We are the people of God, and no longer are you born into the church physically, but you're born into the church by spirit, right? John chapter 3 and verse 5. We are born in the spirit. Everybody knows the law. Everybody is following the law. Everybody understands what it means to be a New Testament Christian. And so that's what you see here. Now, let me do a quick aside, because you probably haven't heard this doctrine, but it is flowing through with a lot of younger preachers, and you'll hear it someday, all right? Um, Every preacher always has to be speaking of the end of his tenure, because he'll either get fired, or he'll move, or he'll die. And the next preacher may have this idea. So, Let's go ahead and cover this, okay? Hopefully I'm not dying anytime soon, and hopefully I'm not moving anytime soon. I try to avoid those moving sermons, you know? The idea is called the doctrine of new heavens, new earth. And a lot of people, especially in the Lord's church, are starting to get all excited about it. And where this comes from, or what this idea is, comes out of Romans 8, where it talks about creation groaning, and creation bowing down under the hurt of sin and praying for the day in which that curse is removed. People take that and they take Ezekiel 34 and they take a passage out of the book of Isaiah where it talks about we're going to live in a land where, uh, you know, the lion and the lamb will sleep together and just have a great time. They go to Revelation 20 and 21 where you see the church and the, the church comes out of heaven and resides looking like perhaps in Jerusalem and there's a literal city which is there and so what they say is that when the earth is burned up it'll just kind of be a cleansing fire and all of us will be here there's no such thing as heaven 
will all be here upon the earth. There will be no more sin, no more dying. It will be just like the Garden of Eden. Hopefully we'll still wear clothes. We haven't got that part down yet. But it will be just like the Garden of Eden. No more death, no more dying, or anything like that. A lot of people love that idea. Uh, I don't. And I'm probably in a minority among a lot of uh, younger preachers. I think I'm still a younger preacher. Because a lot of people really follow that. Now, here's where the issue is. Jesus never really describes heaven. You ever notice that? What's hell? Darkness, gnashing of teeth, eternal fire, the home of Satan and his angels, right? Second Peter chapter 3 kind of repeats all that, doesn't it? It does. It does. Second Peter chapter 3 does, talking about how the earth will be burned up. How does the Bible describe heaven? Have you found the verse where we get to hang out on clouds and play harps? Or we wear the big white robes. Have you found that verse yet? Let's notice how the Bible describes it. The Bible answer of what heaven will be like, the best answer you and I can give, in my view, is I don't know. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, we don't know what our final body will be like. John says, but it's okay because we'll be like Jesus, and that is enough. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we don't yet understand what the third heaven, what we'll be like at the resurrection. He says, it's like a kernel of corn that fell off a plant. Unless it's planted and dies, you'll never know what that plant looks like. You and I could not look at a watermelon seed and say, wow, this is going to be a vine that's just going to take over my garden, go about 10 feet in every direction. And this is going to produce really big, fat, green things. You can't really tell that by looking at the seed. But once you plant it, and then it comes, then you see it. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us our after-resurrection body is the exact same way. We don't yet understand what heaven's going to be like. But what the Bible says over and over and over is we're going to be with Jesus. We're going to be there with him. Now, there's a writer, he's a denominational guy, but he's fairly popular, named Francis Chan. And maybe you've read some of his stuff in a book called Crazy Love and another book that he's written on the book of Romans. What he says in that book is, God never tells us how much gold we're going to have. God never tells us what awesome bodies we're going to have. God never tells us who we're going to know in heaven because... Some people would say, I want to go to heaven and get rich. I want to go to heaven and wear these clothes. I want to go to heaven to see whoever may be. Because of that, because God wants us to have the right motive, the only thing the Bible tells us about heaven is that we will be with Jesus. And there's nothing better than that. Absolutely nothing better than that. Now, we could spend a lot more time... The uh, the verb pronos that's used in the book of Hebrews, I think, disproves it fairly well. And there's some passages in 1 John that disprove it. But that's deeper than we want to get, I think. Well, I know. We are probably already deeper than we want to be. Now, the next important part. I want you to see how exclusive the church is. How many shepherds are there? One. One shepherd. How many flocks are there? Not many flocks. Yeah, there's one flock. Many people in that one flock. Okay? God is making a point. Now, in John 10, Jesus says something interesting. I have sheep that are not of this sheepfold. Mormons love that verse. Denominational people love that verse. Jesus is talking about Gentiles is what he's talking about. There's one church, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus, right? We are all one. There's one church. Don't fall for the goofiness of denominationalism, of saying you can go in any direction that you want to and believe anything you want to. Follow God. Who bought the church? Christ bought the church. Okay? So who gets to make the rules? Jesus gets to make the rules. Who uh, is going to tell you how to worship? Don't listen to the preacher necessarily or the elders or your teacher or your parents. Go back into God's Word be like those Bereans in Acts 17 and study to see if the things that the preacher is talking about are really in the Bible. See if those things are really, truly approved. All right, application. Leaders in the church, 
they got to care about the church. you got to care about the people. Nothing in church <coughs> excuse me, matters more than the people. The Lord didn't say, hey, you know, there will be great rejoicing in heaven when we built a really awesome building. That's not exactly what Luke 15 says, is it? There will be joy in heaven when we get a certain amount in the church treasury. Now, what's it say? When one of these souls is brought to repentance, when a sheep is brought back. Okay, number two, God's in charge. God's ways are higher than man's ways. When Israel added human elements, kings, things went south. Number three, every book of the Bible talks about Jesus. John 5 and verse 58. And so you see Jesus plain as day, even though this is several hundred years before he ever walked the earth. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for our time and study.